Well, g'day. Have you ever come across a thing called discernment ministries? Discernment ministries, what they are is they're all about discerning or deciding or evaluating what is good and what is bad. It's a bit of a Bible jargon word, really, but that's kind of the basic idea behind it. What discernment ministries do is they're trying to prepare Jesus' church to stay faithful to him in a world where false spirits and false teachers and deceivers will come. If I haven't met you before, my name is Aidan. I'm one of the pastors here at Kayama Anglican Church, and today we're talking about discernment in the Christian life because it comes up in our Bible passage, Revelation chapter 2. Discernment can take different forms. It's almost a bit of a seesaw. There's different approaches. There's your very sort of spiritual discernment ministries. And in those, people will encounter the world of the spirits in different ways. And well, they'll make an evaluation as to whether what they encounter is good or bad. And it's almost based on, well, how do I feel about this? In our tradition, we tend to shy away from that sort of discernment when we do it, but you can kind of see that there's a logic there because if you're a Christian and your affections are formed by the word and the spirit of God and you've learned to love what he loves, then the way that you feel about something does matter. The way that you feel about something might give you some idea of its rightness or wrongness because your feelings aren't just feelings. They're feelings that are educated based on the God that you've come to know and love. I think what makes us nervous about operating in that kind of way is that we know that the heart can be deceitful and Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. And so just because something looks right or feels right doesn't mean that it is right. And so you get the other side of the seesaw in terms of discernment ministries, and those are ones which might be more evangelical or word-based. And often what they'll do is they'll compare the teachings of a particular teacher or movement or church with what it says in the Bible. So there's groups like Bethel Church and Christianity on Facebook who focus on that Bethel Church from California, and they evaluate it against scripture. There are groups like the Wartburg Watch, who have a particular focus on how women are treated in evangelical preaching and ministry, and they take an interest in that. There's really all different stripes of discernment ministry. It's a spectrum. But at the end of the day, that's what they're about. It's making an evaluation. This thing that the Christian has encountered in their life, whether it's a spirit or a teacher, is it godly or is it from someone else? Someone good, bad or neutral. That's what they're geared to. Now, if you've ever come across discernment ministries, one thing that you might have noticed, especially if they're on the internet, is that sometimes, sometimes, they can be a little hard-edged in judging what's good and bad. Maybe a little less charitable, a little less loving. It's not that discernment itself is unloving. No, it's actually really very loving to point out a wolf before it eats a sheep. There's nothing wrong with saying this person is a false teacher and they need to not be listened to because it'll take you to a bad place. That's loving. That's caring. And Jesus would commend it. In fact, he does commend it in our passage today. But I think it is possible and you might agree, it is possible for a discernment to be less loving than Jesus would want it to be. And as it happens, that's what we get in Revelation 2. In this passage, Jesus is writing to churches through John. He's writing to seven churches, and they are seven specific churches throughout Asia Minor. But as with most things in the book of Revelation, it's not just about those seven churches. Seven's almost like a biblical code number. It stands for all that is of God. So although these letters are written to specific churches, they're also for every church. 
If you read on through Revelation 2, you'll notice that there are a few times when Jesus writes to specific churches, but then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as we read Revelation 2, the different letters, they're not just for Pergamum or Thyatira or Ephesus. No, they're for anyone with ears to hear. So today's letter is to the Ephesian church and it talks about how they are discerning. They're very discerning and they're very good at it. As they exercise their ministry in the church, they get it right. Jesus says they're good at discernment. And so you'll notice as you read Revelation 2, it says that they have successfully figured out who are apostles and who are not which is no mean feat. I don't know if you've noticed, but we tend to agonize over this stuff. These are hard questions sometimes, like is Benny Hinn legit or not? And what about Kenneth Copeland, that guy with the strange intense eyes on YouTube who's gonna blow away the coronavirus? Well, the church in Ephesus, they had done the work. They had made the evaluations and they could tell you, this one's good, this one's not, this one is, This one's not. They had it sorted. And Jesus says, you've got it. You've done it. You've identified who is an apostle and who is not. He goes further and he says that they hate what he hates, the false teachers, the Nicolaitans who were an early heretical movement. Jesus says that the Ephesians hate their false teaching and so does he. So you can see they're really successful heresy hunters. And it makes sense, right? They had been well taught. If you go back to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, well, that's got some of the very clearest, most beautiful statements on salvation by grace through faith alone. It lays out the doctrine of Christ so clearly. So it makes sense that The Ephesians knew the truth and they could tell you what was false and what was not and what was right and what was wrong and what was of God and what wasn't. But, but, in all of their zeal, in all of their desire to be faithful to Jesus and his teaching, they have a massive flaw so massive that in verse 5, Jesus threatens to take away their lampstand. It's a threat that, well, they wouldn't be able to meet as a church anymore. You see, again, it's coded language. And the code language is lampstands are symbols of God's churches. You know, Jesus says, we're a light, we're a city on a hill, we're like a lampstand. And Jesus says in verse 5 that for all of the Ephesian church's success in discernment, they've got something so wrong, he's going to come and take away their lampstand if it's not fixed. What is it? I mean, what could it be? What would make Jesus want to shut down a church? We'll have a look at the verse. In verse 4, Jesus says, I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. That's massive. Jesus says, for all of your success in discernment and heresy hunting, you have forgotten love. And while he doesn't say what their first love is specifically, we can make an educated guess based on the rest of scripture. So what is the foundational love of the Christian life? Well, it's the love of God expressed in Jesus' self-giving at the cross so that we might have salvation and freedom in him. And when that love changes our hearts, we will love like Jesus did. Jesus says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, not that you're the perfect heresy hunters, but that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the foundation of the Christian life. It's love. The love of God expressed in Jesus and the love that we are called to as followers of him. 
and discernment? Well, at its best, discernment is an outworking of love. We discern because we love God and we want to know what is of him so that we can follow him. We discern because we love the people around us and we want to warn Jesus' sheep of where there are wolves. But Jesus warns this Ephesian church, they've lost the plot. They've abandoned their first love. And it's become more about discernment than it was about love. They've put the cart before the horse. And you know what happens when you do that? The cart gets damaged and the horse is injured. Now, far from being just a first century concern, I believe, and I'm sure that you can be convinced as well, that this is a very live and very relevant warning to Jesus's church in every age, including our own. Particularly, it's a warning to churches that put a lot of effort and energy into honoring God with their doctrine and discernment, as we often do in our circles. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a God-honoring and glorifying thing to put energy into understanding and defending what God has said. You'll notice as you look at your Bible that he took the time to write a few things down to us that he wants us to know. But if we lose sight of love, then we have a massive problem. And I wonder if sometimes we write ourselves a pass and I wonder I wonder if sometimes we run the risk of doing what the Ephesian church did. We write ourselves a pass if we are doctrinally right, even if we are not loving God or those around us. Friends, the most important doctrine in the Christian life is the doctrine of love. Paul, the famous Paul, he was the biggest doctrine head out there and he said, If I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I'm nothing. It's worthless. And so suddenly you can see why it is so crucial to Jesus. The risk is that we could emphasize being right so much that we turn into cold-hearted, doctrinally correct jerks. Except you can't, because that's not possible because you cannot be doctrinally correct if you don't love. That's Jesus's point. That's Paul's point. So what do we do? Well, it's Mother's Day today, and mums know a thing or two about love. It usually runs along similar lines to how Jesus expressed his love for us. He laid down his life, put his rights on hold, shed his blood, sweat, and tears for our sake. And most mums understand a bit of what that's like, right? And teaching and and discerning and being right, well, that's important. You spend the effort and time helping your kids know what's right. But at the end of the day, when they get it wrong, when they fall short or fail, well, good mums don't give you the boot or reject you or close their hearts, do they? Because love is the thing at the top over all of the rest of it. It's what makes everything else matter. So Christian, will you love Jesus and those around you? Will you discern out of love and place that virtue where it belongs, at the very base and at the top of the life of discipleship? Put love in its right spot. God help us if we don't. Jesus threatened the Ephesian church for their lovelessness. And for the one who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches of God. Happy Mother's Day.